you again for having me today. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about ways to improve your website post-pandemic. Uh, some of these are new-ish things. Some are just good practices. Our team, Green Melon, we're a team of eight just off of Marietta Square. Uh, we've been doing this stuff for about 12 and a half years. And really, this presentation is what we do. We help companies and nonprofits improve their websites and just make the most out of them. So if you want to know more about us, feel free to reach out to me afterward and we can chat. But don't want to spend too much time there because we have a lot of stuff to cover. So we'll dig in. So really three areas we'll talk about today, ADA compliance and how that matters for your website and how that's changed a lot all the time, upcoming and some existing privacy laws and what's going on with those. And then just some user behavior shifts we've seen in the last couple of years. Again, nothing major change there, but a lot more has come into focus and is becoming more uh, significant there. So digging into ADA compliance, which is a frankly a weird title for a slide because the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, has 0% to do with websites. It came out in 1990 and the first website was built less than a year prior. So there's 0% of that in the ADA compliance laws. However, there's still lawsuits and stuff that fly around regarding ADA compliance with websites and making sure your website is accessible for, for all users. So ADA compliance isn't really a thing. A set of guidelines called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that sort of govern what you should do on your website, but even that's just guidelines. So between the laws with ADA and the compliance with that, it's a mess and it is a mess. So we'll just unpack some of that. We won't get too deep because there's not any super clear guidance on where to go, but we can certainly help steer people in the right direction. And really the main thing I want to talk about is before we get into how to become more compliant is why you should. In three bullets, you know, why should you care about accessibility? I did the little abbreviation they use at the top because that threw me off for a while. It's the shorthand for accessibility, the 11 being how many letters they omitted in the middle. Uh, you see that being used other places like internationalization is one you see sometimes as I-18N because it has so many letters they take out just to shrink it. So that's more just if you see A11Y, just means accessibility with the 11 letters out of there. But really the first bullet here is why it matters is be a good human. That's really all we should have to say about this. There's people that can't necessarily access all your stuff. They can't read what you have to say. They can't visit your website properly. So you should do what you can to help them. Um, Generally speaking, there's two kinds of disabilities when it comes to the web. Certainly there's nuances beyond that, but there's visual disabilities, people that can't see well or can't see at all. And how do they manage your website and your digital presence? And then those with mechanical difficulties where they can't use a mouse or maybe can't even use a keyboard. And how do they navigate when they don't have those tools in hand? So we'll talk about some of that. Excuse me. Accessibility is great for search engine optimization, SEO. Basically all the things you do to make your site more accessible are things that Google appreciates. You'll tend to rank a little bit better not because you're more accessible, but because the things you do to become more accessible are just good things for Google to see, good for the site. And the last one I alluded to, is you can get sued if you're not accessible. People, if they want to come after you, they can. We'll get into more of that in a little bit. And again, it's a very gray area, but we'll touch on what we can. The next couple of slides I'm going to get into are some quick tips to help become more compliant. And really, I'm going to use the Pareto principle here, the 80-20 rule. You, know, you could spend, I've heard it said, if you want every, if you want your website to be fully compliant to every tiny letter of the law, it's tens of thousands of dollars, but you can get 80% of the way there with just a fraction of the effort. And that's really what I'm going to focus on here. Some of the, the low hanging fruit you could take care of today or this week and just make your site a little more accessible, a little bit better for people to use. Uh, so a few of those things, I'll do them in a couple buckets here. This first one is images and links. You should, shouldn't use pictures of text. People that have a screen reader or whatever, if images are buried or if text is buried in an image, their screen reader can't read it. They can't adjust the contrast. There's things that make it harder to read. So to the extent possible, you should have pictures of pictures and text of text. That could mean a picture with text next to it, or you could put text over an image with CSS and with certain ways to build your website in a way where that text is still literally text that can be read. But for the most part, just keep them separate and you'll be better off there. The second one gets a little bit controversial at times, but don't necessarily have all your external links open in new tabs automatically. People love to do that because they want to keep them on your site, but that's not necessarily in the best interest of your users. So let them decide what they want to do. Two reasons for that I'll give. One is there's some users that are perfectly capable, but just are not that knowledgeable, where if you open a new tab on them, they'll say, okay, that was great. I'm going to go back. And now the back button's broken because you can't go back and say, forget it all. I'm just going to close it all down and go. But the other side is, again, if you open a new tab for someone, a user with disabilities, they don't have a back button now either. And so how do they manage to get that tab closed, but not close the other stuff? And frankly, I'm not sure. So why put them through that? Let them just hit the back button and come back. And if your stuff was good enough, they'll come back. And then lastly, when it comes to images, uh, behind every image on the web is alt text. And basically it's text describing what the image is for people that can't see it. If someone has a screen reader reading the site to them, it's gonna say, hey, here's a picture and this picture is, and it's gonna read that alt text. Uh, so some examples of that, what good alt text would be on it is this. Like, what would good alt text be for this image here? You might say pancakes, and that's really not bad. That's not a bad one, but 
Again, if someone can't see this image at all, it's just pancakes. It's a little vague and maybe the blueberries and stuff matter. You could say it's a picture of pancakes, but that's repetitive. If someone has a screen reader, it's going to say there's an image and it is a picture of pancakes. Well, you know it's a picture. So pancakes, will have some sites that will say this alt text is pancake, pancakes, hotcakes, pancake, breakfast, food, best breakfast, top pancakes, recipe, pancakes. Just trying to keyword stuff to make Google like it better, which is awful. You know, I can't imagine being someone on the screen reader reading that. Uh, so really something for this might be good to say like, stack of blueberry pancakes with powdered sugar. Just describe the image for someone that can't see it succinctly, but accurately. Again, you'll get some search engine benefits out of this, but I encourage you not to focus on that. I see too many people focus on the search engine benefits of this and make it where it's not that helpful for people that actually need the alt text to, to navigate. Hi, sure. Nikki, can I ask you a question? So I'm sure everybody on this call already knows this, but I'm going to ask. Um, this is something that you type in your, if you use WordPress or Wix or something like that, you yep. actually type this in? And you should type this in, yes. Images? When you add okay. an image yeah, in WordPress or anything, on the, in WordPress and specifically on the right-hand side, it'll have the description, all that, and one is alt. It'll have a spot for the alt text and you can type that in. It'll sometimes default it. And that's actually where I was going to go next here is there's a lot of images on the web that the alt text is things like img5867.jpg because it just copied the file name in, which is again, awful alt text. But yeah, you should do that. But I will encourage you not to overthink it because if you look at any of your websites, you have hundreds and hundreds of you know images on the site. You could spend days doing this. So yeah, you don't want to spend that long doing it. Just make it better. Carol asked if we could see an example of how that would look. I could maybe pull that up afterward. I don't have that handy now. But again, when you're adding an image in any content management system, usually there's options for the image. How do you want to align it? How big do you want it? And there's almost always an alt box right? that should get it. Carol or anyone else, reach out afterward if you have a specific issue where you can't find it and that can help you track it down on yours. But I um, encourage you again, just to go through and, and fix as many as you can to the extent possible. Just again, not overthinking it, not spending hours on it, but just instead of this being IMG5867 or pancakes, just stack of blueberry pancakes with powdered sugar and people that can't see it will have a good feel for what's going on. A few other places to look to help with accessibility, adding labels to form, generally speaking, and this is way oversimplifying, the uglier your form is, the better. We have forms a lot of times these days that have the, the box and then in faded gray behind it, it says like first name, which is really cool looking, but someone that has contrast issues can't read first name, a screen reader probably can't read that. It's awful for accessibility. So generally speaking, if you have a label next to it, it says first name and then a box that has the box for first name, it'll work better. There are ways to make it where the subtle stuff behind is accessible, just takes a little more work but it's worth looking at just to see how that works. There's tools that can look at the forms on your site to see how accessible they really are. Uh, use headings on your site. Most websites, frankly, do this pretty well already. If you write decent content, it should be broken down with headers throughout the page, just so all of us can skim through and see what sections we want. But using those headers is good for, for all users. Add an accessibility statement. I put a, link, a short link to ours there. If you type in gmm.to slash a11y, that's the Green Melon Accessibility Statement. I do that because I'm encouraging you to go steal it if you need it. <laughs> So feel free to take ours, use it as your own. It's not necessarily legally sound, but it, it should be pretty solid. The reason for this is interesting though, because I don't feel like most users with disabilities are going looking at accessibility statements to see what they say before they look at the site. I see it more to fend off. Frankly, a lot of lawyers that handle disability things are shady. I mean, certainly there's legit ones, there are legit reasons, there are legit concerns, but a lot are saying, hey, we can make some money because pretty much every site has some kind of accessibility issue. We can sue them for it. And so the thought is, Hey, if they pull up five sites they might go after and yours has an accessibility statement, they'll just say, hey, these people are at least thinking about what's going on. They're trying their best. I'm going to go after these other folks that aren't even trying. It'd be easier, easier to get some money out of them. So it's more just to protect you a little bit there. And there's laws coming that'll help both sides of that, hopefully in the next few years, but we'll see. Um, always use camel case hashtags. Camel case is where you have capital letters in the middle to designate each word. This is such a huge problem like on social media because Again, a screen reader is going to read them as a single word if there's not camel case. And so that word on the right that says, this can be so tricky to read, try to read that as one word. Like, how would a screen reader read that? It would be, this can be strict to, like, I don't know how it would try to say it. Whereas if you capitalize just the first letter of each word, it doesn't look maybe as cool as a hashtag, but it's so much better for, for all of us to read because that can be difficult to read anyhow. But also if someone has a screen reader, it, most screen readers will read it properly if you capitalize the first each word. So I encourage you to do that on Instagram, on Facebook, wherever you have hashtags and just put capital letters throughout there to make it easier for everyone to read. And then the last one is limit PD. This is something that's coming um, right now. I think the law only really applies to governments in the EU. It's a very small subset, but in their case, any PDF they publish on their websites, they have to publish a separate plain text version of that for people to be able to read because PDFs 
often are very difficult for people to digest. And yeah, that's an important thing. And it's probably coming this way. And we'll talk about that in a minute too, that most of the laws we hear about that are just in this one little area, they're probably coming this way. So that's one to keep in mind. And really with PDFs, I've always said, PDFs are for printing. If you need people to print something perfectly, a PDF is fantastic for that because it's going to print the same for pretty much everyone. If it's just content though, it's usually not the best way. Often the easiest way just to toss it up as a PDF versus building a page, but not usually the best way. And laws will probably catch up in the next, I don't know, five years where you're going to have to do more there. So just something to be aware of going forward. Now, another angle to consider that you'll see on more and more sites is the accessibility overlays, accessibility and user way and some of those little thing in the corner with the accessible symbol and people can click on that to make things you know, more accessible. The one click solution to solve all this, and I encourage you not to do, there's a site you can go to called should I use an accessibility overlay.com. And this is actually the top of their website has that. It says no. So it's funny at the top, but it's actually a huge long page that gets into legal cases and theoretical cases and you know users, how they interact with sites and how those overlays generally don't help things. They, they help you feel better perhaps, but going and actually adding proper alt text and making sure you have good contrast and just building the sites the right way is far better than sticking one of these tools on there to, to try to help. I, I do encourage you, it's a funny site, but should I use an accessibility overlay.com is really very insightful, has a lot of information on it that can really help you make your site more accessible for everyone. And then lastly, in this section, um, I'm going to issue you all a challenge. If you're serious about accessibility, I'm serious about this. Try using, put your mouse in a drawer and just use your keyboard for, I say for a day, but if you can do it for an hour, which I tried to do once, an hour is brutal. It is so difficult to not use your mouse to navigate through everything you need to do. So if you want to try this, I would say first go, you can Google like keyboard shortcuts for Mac and print that out and keyboard shortcuts for Chrome and print that out and keyboard shortcuts for Outlook or whatever platforms you have those papers ready and then try it just for an hour, just to try to get from email to email, to send an email, to tab back over and check your calendar. It's shockingly difficult. And there's, I mean, maybe eight to 10% of your users that have to do that on your website. So what is it like for you to do it? And the, the one thing I'll challenge you for on this it's easy to say, I'm gonna do this for an hour, but ooh, I need my mouse just for a second because I don't know how to get to that thing. That's the whole rub is that one little thing that's so hard to get to, fight through it and, and see what it's like. It's, it'll open your eyes a lot. We made a lot of changes to how we build sites and just more empathy for those people that have to do that and how difficult some sites and some programs make that. So we have an hour, hopefully an hour mostly devoted to writing or something. We're not having to click around too much, but at least to get around enough, you'll see what a challenge it is and give it a shot encourage you to try that. That's accessibility there. The next step, we'll get into privacy laws a bit, which is related, but a different angle. So we're gonna start really with the GDPR, the one most people have heard about, the general data protection regulation they brought out in the EU about four years ago. It doesn't really apply to most of us on the call, but I think it's worth looking at for a minute because like with the ADA stuff, this is starting to roll out wider and wider and GDPR gives a great framework that a lot of other countries and states in the US are going to follow, really on six pieces that they, the six principles they talk about. We'll run through those quickly here. Now, the lawfulness, fairness, and transparency, basically just saying, you must tell people what processing you're going to be do doing. Like, here's how I'm going to use your data and then actually be transparent and use it the way you said you would. Purpose limitations, meaning you only use the data for what you requested it for. This is one I think a lot of companies are bad about where someone buys a product and so I have their emails so I'm to toss them on my email list now. Like that's not what they requested there. And again, still legal in the US, but yeah, legal and ethical get into different areas, but in Europe that is not legal. Data minimization, meaning only collect data you need, nothing beyond that. There's, if you need data for a transaction, certainly collect that, but don't collect excess stuff just because you can. Accuracy just means keeping your data accurate as much as you can. Storage limitations mean not keeping data longer than you need it. If, if it's a two year return policy or whatever, you can delete it from your e-commerce store, you should. And then integrity and confidentiality, I think is, is pretty clear. The main piece here is just to work hard to prevent accidental loss and report breaches properly and that kind of stuff. So uh, for most of you, this wouldn't apply uh, to what's going on based on one thing. And if I'm curious in the chat, if anyone knows what this, this signal means in football. Last time I did this, it was a hard fail. So we'll give it a shot again. Yeah, I won't wait too long here, but yeah, it's targeting. So in football, this is targeting. You hear it in college. Yeah, it is a type of personal foul, but yeah, targeting is the word. And in football, it's awful. It means someone made a very hard hit and they're probably kicked out of the game. Uh, when it comes to the GDPR though, it's how are you targeting your users? Because uh, a lot of companies, a lot of companies, a lot of businesses say, hey, I have people from Europe that visit my site. Therefore, I need to follow these laws. You don't necessarily have to, unless you're specifically targeting people in the UK. So what did targeting mean? What would that mean specifically for you? This is the language they use, which is why it reads a little funny with member state here. But if you use the language of a member state, so if you say, hey, here's a German section of our site, well, you're clearly targeting people from Germany, so it probably would apply to you. Use the currency of a member state. If you accept money in currency from the EU. 
If you use a top level domain, if you're cobcollaborative.fr for your French version, like clearly you're targeting people in France and that would apply. If you mentioned customers based in those areas, or if you actually buy targeted ads in those areas, which I don't think any of these apply to probably most of you on here. You're not specifically targeting people in the EU, so it doesn't, the GDPR doesn't apply to you for now. I wouldn't worry about that. However, this next slide maybe will worry you a bit more in that this is legislation that's you know, currently in various states across the country. California has the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, they launched a couple of years ago, which is similar to GDPR. It's different, but I mean, it's the same kind of basic stuff. And you can see all the other states have different levels of stuff in legislation. So it's coming. And that's why I said the GDPR stuff is a good example to follow because, well, every state's going to do it different. It's going to be a huge headache unless we get something national. If you follow the basic guidelines and really just do the right thing, you'll do pretty well. Yeah, this document, yeah, it was actually just from a couple of weeks ago. So it's pretty up to date on what's going on. And you can see there's a whole lot of color on that map. The red ones are the only states that actually have things in law. I mean, I don't know a whole lot other than the one in California, but again, this will be if we do the same talk in two or three years, there's gonna be a lot of red on that map of privacy laws in different states you have to follow and what applies in different states. And it's gonna be a lot to keep up with. So just following those general guidelines is a, a great thing to do. And then the last section I wanna get into is um, about user behavior. So these aren't all new things, as I mentioned at the top. A lot of this is things we've had before, but they've become much more important in the last few years. And some are new, but again, mostly it's just how people are seeing things is so much different. <laughs> coming out of this pandemic. People see the world a whole different way. A big one that I tend to push a lot is less automation. Automation is a great thing. And, and frankly, if you have email automation stuff, there's great uses for that. I'm not saying not to do any, um, but like I like to say B2B, we tend to be a B2B organization, but that's not really a thing. Like it's still person to person. We work with the Cobb Collaborative on their web stuff, but it's not Green Mellon working with Cobb Collaborative, it's Nikki working with Irene and you know, Kelly working with Ashley. And it's, it's still people at the end of the day. Uh, so this proof example here was when about a year ago, I tried to uh, trade my car and ended up in a very bad automated system with this dealership where I submitted my inquiry and they sent an automatic thing back, which the first automatic one back is okay, saying they got it. And so they sent me another one a few hours later saying, hey, we're interested. And I said, great, here's my situation. Never heard anything. They sent one the next day automated. Hey, here's all other things. I said, that's great too. Let's talk about this. Never heard anything. They sent another one the next day and I wrote back. So what's going on here? Um, and Delvin was the guy's name that was, quote, sending these. He said, oh, I'm sorry, things go out without my knowledge. I don't really know what's going on here. And long story short, 23 emails later, I got this poof, you signed up and then you disappeared without ever talking to us. And it was just a very frustrating experience because they were, I'm sure, super proud and paid a lot of money for this great automation system. Whereas if Delvin would have just emailed me, we could have had a five minute conversation and maybe sold a car or maybe not, but been done with it. And instead it was just a disaster because they tried so hard to automate. So we'll get into a little bit more automation. Certainly it can be a good thing, but just be careful. Related to that are things that depersonalize, like the no reply. I detest getting an email from any organization that's from no reply that basically says, I'm going to send you this email, but don't write back. I don't have time to hear back from you. You just listen to what I have to say and do your thing, which just puts a bad taste in your mouth. So uh, the past few years, I actually switched banks. I was with SunTrust, where they sent no replies all the time. They send you an email saying you need to do this thing, but to do it, go call and wait and lot. So now I can reach out to Ed. If I have a problem, I talk to Ed and it's my bank, and he takes care of it. And same with insurance. I moved from Allstate to Liberty Mutual. I'm not sure how they are in general. I think it depends on your agent. But if I have a problem, I now talk to Ashley. I can send to Ashley a text say, "Hey, I have an issue with this, and it's taken care of." I'm not just getting no reply emails from things. Again, just being human is kind of my big thing. I think we all should try to be more human. I think. Frankly, a lot of you on this call do a great job of that already, but I encourage you to, to push harder for that. Um, another example, um, I got this not too long ago, someone reaching out that could help. I'm sure you all get the same spam emails from companies that can help you with your whatever, marketing and all that kind of stuff. But I got an email that said, we can help with telemarketing, email blasts, and automating your connections and messages on LinkedIn. And you just could not have sent a worse email. That just is smells so bad. Telemarketing, of course, you know, any interruption based marketing is just becoming such a bad idea these days. If you're having to interrupt people to try to pitch your stuff to them, that's not generally going to do too well. Automate or email blasts. Now again, marketing is fine, but if you call yours a blast, I would wonder what's behind that. Are you just shooting out to everyone hoping for the best? Or are you targeting on good custom emails that people might actually respond to? You can still send them in bulk. You can still do automations, but just the idea of blasting, which some people say blast and don't really mean it the wrong way, but the idea you got to be careful with. 
And then automating connections and messages on LinkedIn is just awful. I love LinkedIn. I probably spend more time on there than any other, but the automated connections, the automated messages are just awful. I'm a big believer in leave it better than you found it. It's often used with hiking trails and stuff and is fantastic there. But I think the same is true of the internet. Like I can be on LinkedIn and I can contribute and connect with people and do things, or I can spam people with messages. Like one is going to make it a better place. One's going to make it. You'll see this kind of thing in other places. Again, just doing the right thing. Um, a little one I see a lot is companies that put design by links in the footer of sites they build. And that's making the site worse. Now, this used to be a big thing in our industry. It's fading out, thankfully, but this is a company that just forgot who they were serving. This, those design by links make the site they're on rank a little bit worse in Google for the benefit of the designer. That's just not appropriate. <laughs> it's not a good thing to do. Again, doing the right thing is, is, is important. You probably see things like this in your industry, things that you can quote, probably get away with, but just don't try to get away with it. You can leave them better than you found them. Um, a big one here I'm seeing a lot on sites, and actually we helped Cloud Collaborative not too long ago do, do some of this, is Donna Miller's Building a Story Brain. It's a fantastic book. I think probably all of you should read because it applies beyond just marketing to just telling your story the right way. And his big thing is you shouldn't be the hero. None of us should be the hero of the story. You should be the guide to let your customers, your clients, the people you serve be the hero. And you, they're thankful that you helped get them. And the whole idea of Story Brain is just how you position yourselves. His big thing is when people visit your site, you should say, hey, here's the problem you have. Here's how we solve it. And here's how great your life is after we solve it. And people should say, that is my problem. That's me. And therefore, you know, they can go through it. Then they can get to, once they say, okay, this is fantastic. They can solve all my needs. Then they can go to your about us page and read about the history and how you were formed and all that. But too many companies, I think, lead with, here's our history and here's how we were formed. And that's not what people want right away. They want to see how you can help them first and then understand how great you are afterwards. On our site, I think our about us page is like the uh, 32nd most visited page that people arrive on, but it's the second most popular page on our site. And once they read it and say, okay, these folks know what they're doing, not who are they? Let's see if they're any good. Then they'll go read about us once they're once they're captivated a bit. So I encourage you to check out Donald Miller's book. Again, I'm guessing a good number of you probably have already over the years. It's been wildly popular. Inspired a quote from Rory Vaden. Um, he also has a book, uh, Take the Stairs. It's a good book and a podcast and stuff. But I think this quote probably applies to a lot of you. It says, you're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. If you had a problem at some point in your past and you, a lot of people have built their companies to solve that problem, is if you can share with people, hey, here's the problem I used to have that I know you have now, but I've solved it. And here's how we solved it. You know, that's, a lot of you, again, I've seen this problem in our community and here's how we're solving it. So people when they come to the site say, oh, that is the problem we're facing and they've helped solve it. So let's go through that. So you're in a powerful position because you can help serve just who you were 10 years ago in the place that where you think about the issues you had then and that you can help those same people today. Another section on the website I'd like to talk about is just having a goal for every page. Literally every page of your website should have a goal. It's a fun practice, fun for some of us, like to list every page in your site and think about what the goal is for the users on that page. The goal may be just for them to click and visit another page. The goal may be to donate $10,000. The goal may be to sign up for the email list. There should be some goal at the end of every page. This is a local lawyer. Love the guy, he's fantastic, so I'm not gonna call him out by name, but he has a section for all his practice areas. You click on practice areas, he has like the 20 different practice areas he serves, which is great. I think that's fantastic, and you can go to this area and you can read about how he can help with your workers' compensation. The problem is the end of it is previous or next, go read more of his practice areas. Like, who is that for? Yeah, I came here because he can help with this problem. He has a page about the problem, and the goal should be, Great, now that you know how we help with worker compensation, make you better, give us a call, fill out the form, give them a proper call to action. I'm guessing in his case, the template just said, oh yeah, we'll do previous and next buttons. So someone can go through and read all of his practice areas, which just seems insane to me. Like I don't see people doing that, um, but it's because he hasn't thought about it. It's overall a pretty good site. I don't, yeah, don't wanna rag on him too much, but he didn't think about what is the goal for this page. If someone gets to our site, goes to the practice areas and click on, clicks on workers comp, what then is the goal? What do we want to happen with them? Maybe it's just for them to get on our newsletter so we can they can be more connected or maybe it's something other than go view all of our other practice areas. I'd be pretty sure of that. Another area, this one is not new at all, but still is troublesome for some folks is mobile first. People are on their phones more and more. Google is looking at the mobile version of your site more than the desktop one. How does that look to them? I and mean, mobile is interesting because 15 years ago, everyone had the mobile version of the site and the big version. And over time, sites became mobile responsive where they bend and flex to fit, which is exactly what you need to be. Because this screenshot here is actually from the Cobb Collaborative Analytics in the number of different screen resolutions that visited the site last year. If you had asked me how many different size screens visited, I would have thought, okay, there's people with Windows computers, probably 10 different sizes of monitors, and you have a couple different iPhones and maybe 15 different Androids and a couple Macs. So 40, 30 or 40, that's a lot. That's 449 different screen sizes visited the Collaborative website. You can't possibly address all of those 
So just making sure your site works, and again, will adjust and bend to fit anything is, is super important. Um, I won't spend too long here because I think most sites do a pretty good job of that these days. It's not something to worry about too much, but that 449 is just a shocking number to me because the collaborative gets a healthy amount of traffic, but not a ton. But to have 449 different screen sizes just on that site, can you imagine if you have a, a big popular site, a must ministries or something, I can't fathom, they probably got 1,200 different screens that visit and they gotta make sure the site is functional and works for all of them. And it's a challenge, but again, most themes, most you know, content platforms handle that pretty well, but an interesting. Nikki, can I ask you a question? And again, everybody I'm sure knows this, but how does one read this? Is a high number a good number like that? Oh, negative? gotcha. 83% so is that horrible? Is something awry on that page? Gotcha. I'm, yeah, I'm not even sure what that last column is offhand. I, I should probably okay. check that. But this, yeah, there's nothing good or bad with this page. This is just showing here's all the screen resolutions that visit your site and how many people were at each. So you have oh, more people okay. at 800 by 600 than the other one. So there's not a good or bad or anything here. This is just more of a wow kind of thing. You know, it's, I see. It's, yeah. It's a T, not the Yeah, it's about that tiny number okay. in the corner, that 449. This is just the quantity for the wow factor. Yeah, lots of things in analytics there are good there are bad things you need to address here that's not the case this is just an interesting one and you can see this on your own sites just out of curiosity but again if it's more than three you should probably be mobile responsive i think everyone's in the hundreds i'm sure so great question and the last main point i'll leave you with is animations because this is something that's growing a lot people are getting more and more animations on the site and i think in a lot of cases they're there to be cool just because we can which is not a good reason to have animations um Animations can be fantastic. Again, like emailing and automations. There's great ways to do it and there's poor ways to do it. So for animations, I see three main reasons you should animate something on your site. There's impact, focus, and interaction. So impact is like an animation you want where someone comes to your site, they say, whoa, this would be like a big background video or something where they get there and just, wow, this is amazing. You want to draw that impact. The other kind of animation you can have is focus. And this is the one I see that seems just tossed around where you have an animation that's trying to catch someone's eye because you want them to see something on the site. Is you'll see a lot of sites where when things load in, everything's animating. Like it's just animating because it can. Whereas if you settle that down and only animate what matters, you can say, when this piece comes up, it's going to animate. And they're going to look at it for a second. That's what we want. We want them to look there. So have something in mind for them to focus on. And then interaction animations are really when people hover over something to see it's clickable. They hover over the blue button and it turns orange or you know, something like that, just so they, they realize it's clickable. That can be a good thing. I would warn not to hide text behind them. And not again, not many sites do this anymore, but when you hover and then like things appear, that's cool. But again, if you're on a mobile, you can't hover. And who knows if someone's on a keyboard, they certainly can't hover. Like hiding uh, information behind hover effects, behind the animations is not a good idea. But an interaction event is certainly great. If someone's scrolling on the page and their mouse hits something and it turns a different color because they know they can click there, like, great, that's a good use of an animation. But again, have a purpose for them. Animations can be fantastic and we've done all three of these quite a lot on different sites, but we have a reason for doing each of them, not just because the theme has it built in to do something. It's not a great reason to do that. So yeah, so to, to wrap up, really there's just two lessons in the end of that is just be human, don't hide behind fake walls, don't blast people, just do the right thing and be purposeful. Every page should have a goal, every animation should have a reason. Just if you can if you be human and be purposeful with what you do, that's really where things are, are heading more and more and the, the harder you lean into that the better. Yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, we're at greenmelonmedia.com. I'm at mickmel.com. Nikki Mellon is that. So yeah, and certainly happy to answer questions and I can yeah, maybe screen share something live if someone has more questions there. What are y'all need? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mickey. I always learn something when you speak, so it's great. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, and everyone, you are welcome to drop a um, question in the chat. Mickey, I know you had already seen Carol's question about an example of how that would work. And I think that was the alt text question. Yep. Yeah, yeah, if there's something you can share. In the meantime, we got started, but my um, co-host with TechSuit Georgia, Matt, joined us. And so I invite Matt, if you um, want to introduce yourself or come off mute, whatever, if you're in a position to do that, Matt. Maybe not. <laughs> no, he said in the chat, he has to stay muted for now. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Jeffy, I'm so glad that you were able to join us and the entire session is being recorded. So that will go out to everybody who registered so you can pick up on the parts that you missed. Um, so Mickey, monitor the chat as you continue to, if you are able to find an example for Carol. I actually, dropped in the chat. Yes, Carol, I will send um, the slide deck and, and the recording out to everybody. Mickey, I, 
I know that I have been the queen of having all of our things open in a new page and I didn't understand why that was so important not to do. Should I go, should we go back and try to address some of those maybe for our most frequently visited pages or just do better going forward? You're on mute, Mickey. That's a relatively minor thing, I think, in the grand scheme of things. I think it's worth doing, but not worth worrying about too much. I think there's bigger fish to fry in most cases. So yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Worth keeping in All mind. Right. But yeah. So here I am building a page. I want to select an image to add. This is in WordPress for those of you that are in WordPress. And when I go in here to my media library and click an image on the right here, it says alt text. And I can just type in whatever the alt text is. It'll leave it blank in here by default, but yeah, choose my alt text and select it and put it in. And that's all there is to it. You can edit. I have a train rolling by here too now, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> I love being right on the square here, but yeah, we get to yeah. do that. But, but you can do the same with existing images too. Like actually I'll go ahead and put in there's a very poor alt text there. Uh, you can always click on it later and go edit it and change it back out. And I think yet yeah, in the newer WordPress editor, when you click it, it even shows up on the side here. You can change that alternative text uh, to do whatever you want. Again, it talks about describing the purpose of the image. Um, there are cases to leave it empty if it's purely decorative, like for little icons and stuff, but generally put some kind of text in there just so people can see it. And again, it's, a, it's an added bonus to help with your search engine optimization. Excellent. Nikki Carroll's asking, so does it show up when you hover over the image? Oh, good question. So that's actually the title text. That's another box back there called title text. Uh, that is often the same, same text that people use for alt and for title. The title text is less important, at least in terms of accessibility and search engine stuff. It can be useful every now and then to have good title text if you want something to pop up when they hover over it, but it's a technically a separate box for that. I know there's a question from Jeffy, but I want to ask the question. So how does the person um, receive the information about the image? Is that a stupid question to ask? No, it's, it's generally because they have a screen reader. It's generally for people okay. that are heavily vision impaired. So it's reading, it's going to read the header of the page and kind of just start reading through. It's going to say, okay. there's an image here that the text is this because they can't okay. see it. So okay. usually it's, it's voiced to them from a machine. Okay. So yeah. Okay. All right. And then Mickey, do you see the question from Jeffy? If you repeat, okay, so you're, you're talking about, so I assume Jeffy's talking about an image with text on it, which we said not to do, but if you repeat that text in there, I think that's okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. As long as people can get that information, I, I would shy away from it a little bit from one perspective of if someone is visually impaired, not blind, and they can see it, they may not realize what's there. They may be struggling to try to blow up that image, not knowing they've seen it below, but that is probably getting into an edge case. I think generally, if you provide a second batch of that text below it, I think that's probably acceptable. And again, this is the problem with all this is I bet there's not a right answer anyone can provide. There's other laws coming that I think one just died last year in Congress somewhere, but that should address this specific that websites need to do this and people need to get this much warning. And if they don't do that, then you can just like, because right now you can sue people for whatever and hopefully they can at least clarify that things need to do this, but for now just do the best we can. And again, I always think about what's the perspective if someone that's vision impaired or whatever comes to that, what would be the best answer for them? Because the laws aren't going to really tell me. So what would be the best to serve the people that we're trying to serve? And that's, I think, the right perspective. So, yeah. Yeah, mm. see, yeah. I prefer not to put text in images. My staff love to do it. Yeah, that's <laughs> always a tricky part. Yes, understood for sure. Good conversation in the chat. We have a few more minutes. So please feel, I also want to correct myself. I think I misspoke at the very beginning. Our next session in March is, I believe I said March 28th. It's actually Tuesday, March 29th. We're sticking with that Tuesday. And that's the, the demonstration from Trello about event marketing strategies. So hopefully you can join us for that. Again, I will send the slide deck out to everyone and the recording will also be on the TechSoup Georgia webpage. Looks like Jeffy has another question about alt text, Mickey, about, yeah. That's a good question. I think being very concise is the answer. Cause again, someone's trying to get through your content. And if one image takes a whole paragraph for them just to hear about the image, it's probably not doing them a service, but you also, again, don't want to just say pancakes. So you want to at least give a little more context behind it. So it's a tough gray area, but I would say be as concise as you can, but still like letting people at least have some visual in their head of what, what you might be talking about. I don't know if there's a specific limit for characters, like when it comes to the HTML you know, format, but yeah, a lot of website editors will limit it to yeah, various amounts. And I think that limit probably is wise. So yeah, concise and balanced. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Yes, absolutely. Boy, I know I've learned a lot 
how embarrassing is it that I didn't know that's what that alt text box is? Yeah, it's one you never see. Again, the title text you do see if people hover, and that one is more yeah. apparent. Yeah. And again, alt text generally is abused, not generally, but it's frequently been abused over the years by people trying to rank better in Google by just stuffing keywords in there. And for years uh -huh. it worked, but that's mm -hmm. not the purpose of it. And Google's gotten beyond that. So Google's looking for reasonable things in there too. And I suspect Google's getting to the point now where they, Google knows images. It can you know, decrypt, it, see what images look like. And if you have Google Photos, it's really smart. I wonder if they'll get to the point where they can see what an image is and read alt text and know if you're trying to trick them or not. And yeah, trying to trick Google is generally not wise either. So it's a win-win if you just, yeah for the people that need it. So. Mickey Carroll's asked about the purpose for alt text for Google search, but I think Jeffy answered that no. Yeah, I think yeah, it's really to help part, those yeah. with who have visual impairment. Exactly. That's what it's, that's entirely what it's intended for is, yeah, for people with visual impairments that can't see the image, that have it, their text being read to them saying, this is an image of blueberry pancakes with maple syrup or whatever on it. And again, Google looks at that and it does impact that. But yeah, the main purpose is helping people understand the content of your site if they can't see it. So. Google's just a secondary Mickey, benefit. Mickey, I really liked what you said about take time to do an inventory of your website, if you will, and mm -hmm. look at the goal of every page um, of your website. I think that's sage advice for all of us. It's difficult. For some that. pages, it's hard to come up with a decent goal for, but you want it there. But yeah, it's worth at least thinking about and doing the best thinking you can. Thinking about exactly. Because you don't so. do silly things like that lawyer. Like, he'd be better off just taking the previous and next buttons out and let him at least get to the footer in contact or something. You know. Yes. Clearly didn't think about it. So even if it's not a great answer, just thinking may at least clear things up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Jeffy, what is your organization? I'm curious, or maybe you don't want us to go to your website. <laughs> the library. Okay. Thank you. Libraries. I have a saying that this isn't your, I know our library in Cobb County. I always say this isn't your grandmother's library. This isn't your mother's library. Our libraries have so much information and they reach people in so many different ways other than just going to check out a hard copy book. I don't know. Maybe you have to have so many pages. Yeah. According to Google, there's around 2,300 pages on that site. So yeah, that's a lot to. <laughs> oh, wow. You know. That is a lot. <laughs> and again, a lot of, I think, yeah, I'm looking at it briefly here. A lot of them are like the branches and you know, I think a lot of them have very clear goals on them. If someone's going to a yeah. branch page because they want the address or phone number and it's probably there already and you're good to go. Yeah, if you do a, a Jeffy or anyone else, if you do site colon in Google, do the word site colon and then your address, Google will spit out what they think all your pages are. Here, I'll, I'll share real quick for those that want to see okay. that. Okay, yeah, um, Carol just asked that question. Yeah, So Mickey's that. going to help um, us find that. Yeah, so if I search for site colon right here. I'm going to scroll back up. It'll say Google sees roughly 2,350 results. Uh, you can do that for any site. Obviously, it's not just yours because I have no connection with them there. Yeah, so it's just a quick way to see how many Google sees, which isn't how many pages you have in total because Google may choose not to index them. But Google, of course, I don't want to get into a huge SEO thing, but Google doesn't search the internet. Google makes a copy of the internet to the extent possible on all their servers, trillions of pages. And so how many of your pages did they happen to save on their servers? Which should be most all of them if you have a decent site that isn't necessarily all of them. So it's saying we have 2,300 pages that we've decided to copy and maybe show up in search, but you may have more than that, but that's usually a pretty close guess. Yeah, so that can be helpful just for that kind of thing. Yeah, and Jeffy, that is a lot of pages, <laughs> so, for sure. <laughs> Again, um, Mickey, thank you so much for sharing so much great information with us today. Yes, Carol, I echo that. Sorry, my co-host Matt, it wasn't able to come off mute and extend his greetings, but I know Matt has a real passion for also serving the nonprofit community, not only here in the metro Atlanta area, but also across Georgia and probably beyond. On behalf of Matt um, and myself, we want to thank Mickey so much for sharing his time and expertise with us.